Good morning, and welcome to online worship for Spencer United Methodist Church for Sunday, May 2nd, 2021. Pleasure to have you worshiping with us this morning. And to start off, I would like to uh, sing together the hymn, This Is My Father's World. And uh, let us sing this together and remember uh, how the natural world, how all of creation bears witness to God's diverse creativity. So let's sing this song together. This is my Father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my Father's world, I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, His hand the wonders wrought. This is my Father's world. The birds their carols raise, the morning light, the lily white, declare their Maker's praise. This is my Father's world, He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear him pass, he speaks to me everywhere. This is my Father's world, oh let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world, why should my heart be sad? The Lord is King, let the heavens ring, God reigns, let the earth be glad. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the beautiful diversity of creation. You are so imaginative, your wisdom so vast. And God, we can be tempted so often to put you into our little box, to limit you to what we understand. But God, you are so much bigger than anything that we can think of, than, than we can imagine. Your perspective so broad that it would boggle our mere human minds. And so God, help us to leave an openness to what you want to do in your own way and help us not to insist that things be done our way or the way that works for us individually only. Help us to be sensitive to what you want to do in the lives of us, your diverse people. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. There it is. I don't know, but I've been told. Doing poetry is cold. Left, 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 right, left, 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 right, left, left. Oh! Thank you, gentlemen. You notice everyone started off with their own stride, their own pace. Mr. Pitts, taking his time. He knew he'll get there one day. Mr. Cameron, you can see him thinking, is this right? It might be right, it might be right. I know that, maybe not, I don't know. Mr. Overstreet, driven by a deeper force. Yes. We know that, all right. Now, I didn't bring him up here to ridicule them. 
brought them up here to illustrate the point of conformity, the difficulty in maintaining your own beliefs in the face of others. Now, those of you, I see the look in your eyes like, I would have walked differently. Well, ask yourselves why you are clapping. Now, we all have a great need for acceptance, but you must trust that your beliefs are unique, your own, even though others may think them odd or unpopular, even though the herd may go, that's bad. <laughs> Robert Frost said, two roads diverged in the wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. And I want you to find your own walk right now, your own way of striding, pacing, any direction, anything you want, whether it's proud, whether it's silly, anything. Gentlemen, the courtyard is yours. You don't have to perform. You can make it for yourself. Mr. Dalton, you'll be joining us. Exercising the right not to walk. Thank you, Mr. Dalton. Just illustrate the point. Swim against the stream. That clip was from the film Dead Poets Society, in which Robin Williams plays a, an English teacher at a boys' school. And here he gives his students a lesson about the dangers and the problems with conformity over diversity. Conformity as a value suppresses diversity, tries to force everyone into the same mold, forces everyone to be the same. And it's odd because when we look at creation, we see plenty of diversity. I'm talking about, for instance, the diversity of life. Think of all of the different uh, species in the world that God has created. There are about 1.74 million species that have been identified and formally categorized by science. However, it's estimated that there might be as many as 1 trillion species which means that we have discovered, named, identified, cataloged a very small percentage of what's out there. But that's the kind of diversity of life that God has uh, created on this earth. Look at all of these different creatures and how different they are, their different functions in nature, the different ways they move and survive and eat and protect themselves. Look at that variety. It's different, but it's not wrong. And it's beautiful to see how creative our God is. And you know, it's true of us human beings too. We're diverse. And we're diverse in ways that aren't obvious. You know, we, we do... Uh, talk a lot about variations in uh, appearance, you know, the differences between men and women, the differences uh, among people of different ethnic or cultural backgrounds, you know, uh, things that, you, distinctions you can see on the surface. But you know, there's more to diversity than that. Every single person brings with them a different experience, a different history, uh, growing up in a different family, in a different geographical area. Everyone's mind works differently. Everyone's experience is a little bit different. Everyone's biology and physiology is a little bit different. Every single person has their own collective experiences that have been shaped by where they grew up, what they look like, what sort of physical characteristics they carry. And those experiences shape the way we view the world. And because none of us have the same collection of experiences, we all look at the world differently. We can look at the exact same thing and see it very differently. And here's the question I want to pose. If we are so diverse in all of these different ways, 
is there really any reason to think that God would work in exactly the same way in all of our lives? God is so big and God's perspective so grand that he understands each and every one of us better than we understand ourselves in all of our diversity. God understands diversity better than any of us do. And so why would we limit God to work in people's lives that are so diverse in exactly the same way? Why do we expect every life devoted to Jesus to look exactly the same, at least on a superficial level? Let me, let me give you an illustration from Scripture of what I mean. This morning, I'm starting a series called From Paul, Thoughts on the Church from One of Its Greatest Leaders. The Apostle Paul, as I talked about him last week, was at first a skeptic when it came to the Christian faith. He actively persecuted followers of Jesus uh, as the church was getting started. But he had a rather dramatic conversion experience, completely did a 180, and actually became one of the greatest Christian leaders in the very first generation of Christians there ever was. And so, there's wisdom in looking at what he has to say to the churches in his time, and perhaps learn what that has to say to the church in the present. So, I've been talking about diversity, and believe it or not, in the very first, among the very first followers of Jesus, the very foundation of the church, which is the community of people who follow Jesus from all times in history and from all places in the world, when I talk about the church, I'm not talking about Spencer United Methodist Church. I am talking about the universal community of everyone who uh, follows or has followed Jesus Christ. That is what I mean by the church, this community that has been formed uh, under the authority and lordship of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. And in this community, there was diversity, and mainly that diversity was among uh, Jews who had come to believe in Jesus and non-Jews, known as Gentiles, who had also come to believe in Jesus. Now, they were coming from two different backgrounds here. Here, the Jews were coming from a background that went back uh, 2,000 years all themselves. They were the heirs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the ones who uh, had uh, generations before received God's law through the prophet Moses. They are the people who had journeyed with God for generations and uh, who uh, had looked forward to, uh, in all that time, God's uh, ultimate uh, answer, which was brought uh, by Jesus himself. They were Jews who saw Jesus as the, the final word of God, which of course he was. But that was where they were coming from. And then there were these Gentiles who uh, may or may not have known anything about the Jewish faith, they may have uh, been more likely to be familiar with the Roman and the Greek gods. You know, the Greek gods, Zeus and Hera and Hermes and, and all those guys. They also might have at least known something about the ancient Greek philosophers who had, were long dead by this time. And so that was the cultural angle that the Gentile Christians were coming from. They were both coming from completely different angles, from completely different backgrounds, and so it shouldn't surprise us that in the early days of the church there was tension 
between these two groups. And one of the major issues that came about had to do with whether or not this new worshiping community that was formed of both Jews and Gentiles who had decided to follow Jesus should still continue the old Jewish practices instituted under Moses. And I'm talking about things like circumcision, dietary laws, uh, the observance of the Sabbath, in other words, ceasing work every seven days. Those were part of the law of Moses, and there was some debate as to whether or not those were essential to following Jesus. And of course, two uh, ways of thinking about it developed, and... Uh, And one of them was that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. He, is, he himself was a Jew and observed the Jewish law. And if we're to imitate him, then we all, Gentile and Jew alike, should align with the old law of Moses. And, uh, and not to mention the fact that all throughout their history for generations, any time a Gentile wanted to convert to Judaism, to the, to the religion of the Jews, uh, they had to undergo those things, and they were expected to observe those. And so in the eyes of the Jewish Christians, it was no different when a Gentile decided to follow Jesus. They still had to uh, satisfy the requirements imposed uh, under the authority of Moses. And so that was that perspective. But the other perspective was that the old law of Moses was fulfilled by Jesus. Only Jesus could fulfill the requirements of the law. No one else ever has. And, and that that was the whole point. Jesus satisfied the law because we were incapable of doing it. And so now we live by faith in Jesus, not based on our own merits. When we who follow Jesus do what is right, it's God's Holy Spirit working through us. It's not by a mere human effort in obedience to a set of rules anymore. And so you had these two different perspectives on these uh, Jewish customs, these laws instituted under Moses. Now, Paul actually came down pretty hard in favor of the second view, the view that uh, no one should be expected to follow those old Law of Moses regulations because they serve their purpose, and that purpose was ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. And so now it is faith in Jesus and the power that the Holy Spirit gives that makes one righteous, not obedience to a set of laws. He even goes on record as confronting Peter, another significant leader in the early church, one who had actually been with Jesus even longer than Paul had, but he confronted Peter because Peter would eat with Gentiles until his Jewish friends came, and then he would eat separately from the Gentiles. And Paul called him out on that. He considered that hypocritical. So Paul came down hard in favor of what you might call the more progressive view in this situation, that Gentiles should not be expected to uh, abide by the ancient Jewish law. It's their devotion to Jesus that makes a difference, not their adherence to certain religious practices. So that's the background. But apparently this particular issue came to the forefront in the church in the city of Rome. Now remember, when Paul went from place to place planting churches along the Mediterranean coast, he would stop in the cities. And so Christianity started as an urban movement. And so Christianity flourished in the cities first before going to the rural areas. And Rome was the New York City of its day. Rome was the, the center of civilization at the time. So it shouldn't surprise us that there was a significant diversity among the, the Christians there. 
some combination of Christian Jews and Christian Gentiles. And so to address the, this tension between these two groups, this is what Paul wrote. He tells them, accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master's servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own minds. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord both of the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we all will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, excuse me, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I'm convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person, it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you're no longer acting in love. Do not, by your eating, destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat because their eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. So that's a lot. But let's unpack it a little bit. First of all, let's start off with these two groups that Paul has in mind. Now, some shared Paul's view. They, those are the ones who believed that they weren't limited by the old Jewish dietary laws. They, they didn't necessarily have to observe the Sabbath, although I would add that it's a good thing to do anyway. That, uh, that they didn't have to observe certain days. They didn't have to observe uh, 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 certain uh, uh, religious practices that the Jews had been doing for generations. But, and those who shared Paul's view, uh, he describes 
as those with strong faith. Now, he doesn't use those words exactly, but they're, they're held in contrast to those who have weak faith. And so it implies that Paul thinks that those who believe themselves to be free from these regulations actually have a stronger faith. But he tells them, and again, these are the people he agrees with, not to treat with contempt those who wish to continue the old Jewish practices. He also addresses those who, dis who had the other view. He tells those who wanted to continue those practices, whom he does call those with weak faith, he tells them not to judge those who don't engage in those old religious practices. Now, let's stop a moment and talk about why he calls one group a group with strong faith and one group uh, a group with weak faith. First of all, uh, I think in Paul's eyes, those who believe themselves to be freed from the old Jewish regulations, uh, they were leaning more into their faith in Jesus to bring transformation in, in their lives. I think that, that they were exemplifying in a beautiful way that we are not made righteous by what we do or by following a set of rules. We are made righteous through faith and the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what makes us righteous, not following a certain set of rules, rituals, or customs. But um, those who continue to engage in those practices maybe they needed those practices to strengthen their faith. I mean, for crying out loud, these were the practices that they had been taught from their childhood is what it took to endear oneself to God. That's a pretty hard thing to let go of. So it may very well be that they needed those to strengthen their faith. So some people needed those practices and some people did not. Now, those who did not might have looked down on those who did and might have concluded, hey, wait a minute, they're still trying to earn God's love. They're, they're lacking in faith. And so there's the judgment that Paul doesn't want them engaging in. But on the other hand, those who did continue the Jewish practices might have looked at those who did not as uh, behaving irreverently. And so, and therefore treated them with contempt. And so what Paul is doing, although he agrees with one side more than the other, is he's stepping into this situation saying, look, be nice to each other. You guys are coming from completely different backgrounds. And so your experience of walking with Jesus is going to look different. Now, I think it's worth mentioning that both sides uh, taken to the extreme can be a slippery slope. Those who didn't want to uh, follow the old regulations uh, from the law of Moses could have slip in, slipped into what we call antinomianism, a belief that there is no right and wrong, which is certainly not the direction we're supposed to go as Christians. We're supposed to have the law of God written on our hearts. It may not be about obeying a set of rules, but it is still about being a certain kind of person. On the other hand, the danger in um, sticking to the letter of the law is a slippery slope into the opposite of antinomianism, what we call legalism, where one's righteousness is determined by obeying a st set of rules, checking off a checklist. And neither of those represent what the Christian life is about. But I digress. Let's talk about the advice that uh, Paul gives this community of faith that has this sort of, of uh, spiritual and religious diversity. He says, ultimately, those people must follow their consciences. He says in Romans uh, 14, 5, each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. 
He says in verse 14, I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person, it is unclean. In that second one, he plainly says that, um, that he, he says he doesn't believe that anything is unclean. But if someone believes that something is unclean, then it's unclean for that person. And so the point he's trying to make here is that when it comes to religious practices, it's ultimately the responsibility of every individual to follow his or her own conscience. And no one should be forced to violate his or her own conscience. He says in a couple of different places, first of all, he says, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. We should not create a situation in which someone feels compelled or pressured to violate his or her conscience. He says, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. In verse 23, I don't have a slide for this, but in verse 23, Paul writes, Whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat, because their eating is not from faith. You see, God speaks to us through our conscience, and when our conscience is pricked about something, if we do not, even if we're mistaken, even if it's totally acceptable in the broad scheme of things, if we feel our conscience being pricked, it is an act of faith to listen to that conviction. And so even if something is completely acceptable and uh, permissible in general, it may not be acceptable or permissible for the individual. Paul also tells us to uh, make every effort to do what leads to peace and a mutual edification. We are meant to create a peaceful environment in the church in which everyone can be built up spiritually, however that process looks. Whatever spiritual disciplines and religious practices are involved will look different from person to person. But we are meant to create a place of peace where everyone can be built up spiritually by each other. Even if the person next to you has a a different spiritual path, a different spiritual journey than you do, you can still help build that person up. And we are to create a peaceful environment in which to do that. Now, that doesn't mean a false peace. When we have conflict, Jesus commands us more than once to address it, to get it out in the open. But that is part of what it means to be a peacemaker, to work through conflict and come to a point of peace and reconciliation. But mostly what we get from Paul is the impression that he thinks the whole thing is a distraction. He comes down on one side, but his conclusion is that the debate itself is a distraction. What really mattered was the pursuit of righteousness in devotion to Jesus. He says, whoever regards one day as special does to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord for the give thanks to God. Whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. What matters is that in a spirit of devotion to Jesus, we pursue godliness and righteousness, something that is planted in us by the Holy Spirit and is not
not something that is produced by mere human effort. We engage in spiritual disciplines, we engage in worshipful activities and even acts of service to give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to work on our hearts. Those things in and of themselves, what we call works of piety, are meant to enrich and build us up spiritually. They themselves are not righteousness, but they are practices meant to nurture righteousness in us. In different practices, different spiritual disciplines are going to work differently for different people. And so not a, no, not a one of us is going to have the exact same spiritual journey that other people have. We all come to Jesus in different ways, at different times, and in different spiritual states. And because our coming to Jesus is so varied, we learn from him in different ways and at different rates. Now, our own individual spiritual experience might inform someone else's journey, but we cannot assume that their journey will be the exact same as ours. And so what we are to do as a church is to create an environment that helps each individual discern what God wants to do in his or her own life. Now, we do have a common foundation. We do have a common source of understanding, and of course, that is Jesus himself as revealed in the scriptures. But the exact precise application in one's life may not look the same for everyone. The point is that the church is to be a community that resources and guides people along whatever journey on which the God and Father of Jesus wants to lead them. And that journey will look different from person to person, and we should never be a place where we denigrate, alienate, or reject a person because his or her journey looks different from ours. And so as we at Spencer United Methodist Church, seek God's guidance about what our vision should be as a church. We need to keep in mind that we are to be a community where people can be helped along on their own journeys with God. We shouldn't expect everyone's journeys to look exactly the same on the outside. We shouldn't expect everyone to fit into some prescribed mold. Instead, what we need to do is create space in which everyone can explore their faith in their own way. Because that is how we make disciples of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this ancient community called the church. This community that is made of people from every tribe, language, and nation. We are a diverse people, even those of us who might look similar or come from similar places. We are diverse in our histories, our experiences. And so we may experience you in different ways. But you are one God. Your Son is our one Lord. And that is enough to unite us. And so in all our variations and diversity, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work in us in whatever way you deem appropriate, shaping us to be more and more like Jesus in character. In whatever way that appears in our own context, in our own lives, it may look different, but deep down it comes from the character of Jesus planted in us by the Holy Spirit. We pray that you would work in us and that you would work through our worshiping community, our, our family, our community of faith to accomplish just that in not only our lives, but the lives of those in our community. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
In all of our diversity, we are nevertheless united by a single common foundation. And I'd like us to sing that song together. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. Elect from every nation, yet one o'er all the earth. Her charter of salvation, one Lord, one faith, one birth. One holy name she blesses, partakes one holy food. And to one hope she presses with every grace endued. Though with a scornful wonder we see her sorrow pressed, by schisms rent asunder, by heresies distressed. Yet saints their watch are keeping, their cry goes up how long. And soon the night of weeping shall be the morn of song. Mid toil and tribulation and tumult of her war, she waits the consummation of peace forevermore. Till with the vision glorious her longing eyes are blessed, and the great church victorious shall be the church at rest. Yet she on earth hath union with God the three in one, and mystic sweet communion with those whose rest is one. O oh, happy ones and holy, Lord, give us grace that we, like them the meek and lowly, on high may dwell with thee. And now as you go about your week, may you take joy in the diversity among God's people, and in the one Lord and one Spirit and one God who unites us. Whatever path may bring us together, what may, whatever path God may lead us along, we are united by our common Lord. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.